Well, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And as I have outlined a couple times within Romans 7, we are looking at the second section of Romans 7, which spans from verse 7 all the way through verse 13. And today, my goal is to look at verse 8 and into verse 9 today. And so as you're turning, let's go ahead and let's pray and we'll look at God's Word. Father, You are certainly a great God. You certainly reveal to us through Your Word how how you are holy and you are righteous and just and good. We also, you also reveal that you are love and that you're faithful, and that you're kind, and that you're, you show loving kindness to those who do not deserve it. And Father, certainly we are the recipients of that loving kindness. Father, certainly your grace is greater than we could ever understand. And Father, I pray that this morning as we look at your word that the grace that you show us as sinners would be evident, especially as we look long into the law and we see that we have to have Christ, that we have to have his righteousness. And Father, I pray that that would be the effect of what we see this morning, that we would understand and continue to grow and how to properly use the law. And Father, I just ask now that you be gracious to us, that your spirit would abide with us, because we know that without him that this is, this is all vanity, and it's just chasing after wind. And so we, we ask now that you be good, that you just allow me to clearly convey this truth that's found here, and that you'd be glorified and honored because of it. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read that entire section from verse 7 to verse 13 of chapter 7. Where the Apostle Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Now, in... 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Paul tells us something that goes right along with what I've just read to you. Where he reveals there, he says, but we know that the law is good. And then he says this, if one uses it lawfully. And here in Romans 7, as I just mentioned, Paul is basically making that argument. And we know that there is... All this confusion that surrounds how we should view the law, how we should use the law, especially within the New Covenant context. But also, we have to ask the question that many people have, and they're questioning, well then, is the law good or is it bad? Is it something evil or sinful? I mean, if you would talk and you would go to many evangelical churches across this country today and you would sit in their services, you might probably walk away with the idea that the law is inherently bad. It's a negative. There's something wrong with it. It it was something in the past that is 
of no benefit to us now. It's something that actually gets in the way. For Paul himself is found guilty by his Jewish peers for basically the same thing, disregarding the law of God. However, their accusation against him has no credibility. They see how Paul describes the law and they are appalled. And we can even see from this letter to the church in Rome how this view of the law could be misunderstood up to this point, this view that Paul has been setting forth. As we've already seen in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, that Christians, the believers, they are not under the law. And then he turns around in Romans chapter 7, verse 5, and he declares that not only does the law not aid in our sanctification, not only does it not lead us to holiness, but instead it actually acts as a hindrance. It's an impediment as it arouses sinful passions that exist in the members of our body. And it is for this reason that what Paul sets out to do here in verses 7 through 13 is to vindicate the law of God. He wants to set the record straight regarding the law of God and its proper function and use. That's why he says what he says there as he opens up in verse 7. When he asks the question, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And he says, may it never be. And then don't forget what he says next. On the contrary. Actually, the exact opposite could be said. And then his defense of the goodness of the law then proceeds from his own personal experience and interaction with with the law of God. And this personal experience and interaction with the law is what we are going to be following throughout our study here in chapter 7. As I mentioned last time, chapter 7 from this point forward is littered with all of these personal pronouns, these eyes, these me's. He's going to explain to us the proper use and function of the law why the law is good, he's going to vindicate it by his own personal experience, encounter with the law. For Paul's argument through this is that it's not evil, it's not sinful, but it holds this great value in God's plan of redemption. It has this good and glorious function, for it is the instrument in which God has given us And which brings about the conviction of sin. And I mentioned last week that the law of God, it really serves the gospel in this sense. It acts as a a forerunner to the good news. As it discloses to us our, our ruin and our misery as sinners. It shows us that our righteousness, our inherent righteousness, is inadequate And it's just not inadequate, but it's filthy rags. And then what it does is it sets the stage for Christ's righteousness. That righteousness that we desperately need to be accepted before a holy God. That righteousness that comes exclusively through faith. And I set before you that here in verses 7 through 13, that Paul discloses... Four ways in which the law brings conviction upon the sinner. The ways in which it serves the gospel. The four, verse one, verse seven, the one we looked at last week, it reveals sin. And we'll come back and review that a little bit. The second thing that we're going to look at today in verse eight is that the law provokes sin. In verses 9 through 11, we're going to see how the law devastates the sinner. Or we could say, basically, he he tells us how the letter kills. And then in verses 12 through 13, he exhibits the true nature of sin, of our sin, as he really describes the sinfulness of sin. Let's just briefly review verse 7. Paul says there in verse 7, on the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have 
known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So as I explained last week, this is here the idea of how the law reveals sin. And we must understand that it's not that it just gives us some kind of head knowledge regarding sin, but a practical understanding and conviction that we in our person have sinned against God. That we fall woefully short. And the law gives sin a name. It clarifies sin. It, it reveals its true identity. For the law serves and gives this revelatory function in ministry. It reveals to us that what God says about us is true. We are the sinners that God says that we are. In Tudor-like fashion, it reveals to us how woefully we fall short of God's holy standard. Because the law is the measuring stick. It is this canon of righteousness. And when you go measure yourself beside it, you see that you don't even become close to measuring up. Which then brings us to verse 8. And really our focus this morning. The idea that the law provokes sin. He says there, but sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now notice here what Paul does here with the word sin. He starts off, but sin. What he does here is he's going to go back and do things that he has been doing here over the last couple of chapters. He personifies sin again. He presents sin as this power. This power that works within the members of our body. Here he describes it as being active. And you'll notice here that that sin is just not active in this personified state, but it's intentional as well. And it's not only intentional, but in its intentionality, there is a cunning aspect to what sin does in us. Look there at how Paul describes this sin, what it's doing. He goes on to say that taking opportunity through the commandment. You can see how he personifies sin here. It's it's, it's taking advantage of something. It's taking opportunity through the commandment. And this is Paul's way of describing how cunning and powerful that indwelling sin is. For he describes sin, the sin that is in us, as something that will go and exploit God's law. He takes advantage of it. Sin looks at the law and it says, I see an opportunity here. I think I can use the law to my advantage. I'm going to manipulate her and use her for my benefit. That's what Paul is describing here. Now notice, look at that word there, opportunity. This Greek word indicates a starting point. So when you think of this in this context, think of a, a trailhead that you start at before you go into the woods, into the, up into the mountains on a, a hike. Or if you want to think about this in, in military terms, think about this as a, a base of operations or the beachhead in which an attack is launched upon the enemy. So the idea here is that that sin will strategically use the law as a starting point to exercise its dominion or to launch its attack. I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones does. He points out in his commentary that some of the old translators would actually translate this word fulcrum. As if sin is using the law as a fulcrum to in which to leverage its work as if sin was just sitting around and saying i need to move this object 
the way that I want it to move, and I need help. Hey, look, there's the law. I think I'm going to take advantage of it. I'm going to pry against it. I can work more powerfully if I have something to leverage against. The law will work perfectly in regard to this. It will be a perfect instrument in which to leverage, in which to have more power. And what is being described here is that the commandment, here specifically with Paul, the 10th commandment, that you shall not covet, was used as an instrument by sin in order to work more powerfully inside the heart of Paul. That is what Paul is saying happened to him. Look what it goes on to say. He says, it produced in me coveting of every kind. That word produced, or as some of the older translations might use the word wrought, this is to work powerfully. This is to accomplish something, to put something into effect entirely. So what it's describing here, what Paul's describing is that when sin does this, it just doesn't attempt at it and fail. But it succeeds. It conquers. It overpowers. That's what this language is communicating. This is exactly what Paul says has happened to him. As it produced in him coveting of every kind. Of every genre. He says when that commandment came, when I heard it said, Paul, it produced in me all sorts of evil desires and lusts infiltrated my mind and my heart. That's what he's communicating here. This is very similar to what Paul has already said back in verse 5 of this chapter. Remember when he said, For a while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, now notice the language, which were aroused by the law, were at work, there's that language, work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. It is as if Paul is saying that this sin that's in us will lie dormant, it will be slumbering, but when the law comes, when faced with the commandment, it awakens, it is aroused, and it stirs up all sorts of, for him, lusting and covetous thoughts. And that is why Paul describes here in verse 8, as he goes on to say, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, I want to point out something here in this last phrase here, for apart from the law, sin is dead. And what's interesting here is that in the Greek, there's actually not a verb in that phrase. And I would guess that in your Bible that you have with you this morning, within that phrase, the is in there is in italics. And what does that tell us? If it is in italics, might depend what translation of a Bible you have, by the way. If it's a good translation, it'll have it in italics, most likely. Why is that? Well, that tells you that, that there's not actually a word in the Greek, right, that is translated for that word. It means that we've got to fill it in because when, it, when you translate it over to the English, it wouldn't make sense. That's not proper grammar. We need that is there, otherwise it will sound weird. I mean, we would read it, it would be, for apart from the law, sin dead. That's how it would read, if we were really literal about it. So we have to add these things in order for it to make sense. Now what's interesting though, when translators choose to word, use the word is, like I've been reading to you in the New American Standard, it establishes the fact that Paul now again is declaring a general principle here. Much like he has in other places, like he's just stating this principle. This is what happens. And of course that is true. Just as it says in Romans chapter 5 verse 13, sin is not imputed when there is no law. That's a general principle. That's a general statement. It is a true statement. However, I don't think that's what Paul's conveying here. I don't think he's conveying the general principle again. I actually agree with John Murray that instead of is, we should be using the word was 
here. Sometimes if you might have an old King James Version, they translate this was instead of is. And it will read like this. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Now why is this important? Why do I make this distinction? This seems very subtle. But here's what it does. It takes this statement from being a general principle to being a personal experience, which is actually in context, I believe, what he's saying here. And what Paul is saying is that this sin was always inside of him, but it was lifeless. It was inactive. It was, as I mentioned earlier, dormant. And when the commandment came, it was activated. It was aroused from its slumber, and it worked powerfully in Paul. The law triggered this rebellion in his heart. That's what he's communicating. So what is he describing overall with this whole statement here in verse 8? What does this look like that he's talking about? How do we understand this? Or maybe we could even ask, how does this happen to us? Well, let's just say I decide that I kind of just want to be a legalist from now on and I want to just start making a bunch of rules and laws for you guys when you come to church on Sunday morning. And I decide for some reason that I'm going to make a rule that from now on nobody is allowed to wear purple ball caps to church on Sunday morning. Now you might think this is ridiculous. I'm trying to get out and ridiculous just to prove a point. Now, and I do that because I don't think, or I'm kind of hoping actually, that no one's actually had the urge on Sunday morning to wear a bur- purple ball cap to church and to come here. So that's what makes the rule seems funny. But what ends up happening is when people make rules like that, now what happens is, that since there's a law, the idea comes into their mind. And people will respond in all sorts of different ways. They might respond, I mean, Who does this guy think he is telling me I can't wear a purple ball cap to church? I mean, if I want to wear a purple ball cap to church, I'm going to wear a purple ball cap to church. Or this is a dumb rule. I don't like this rule. And then what ends up happening when you start thinking that way? You start considering wearing a purple ball cap to church. You want to do it then. And I know this sounds kind of funny, but... This is how he's describing this working. Before, I might have never even thought about it. It wasn't even something that I was that concerned about until the point is there was a law against it. I was made aware of that law. Now I want to do that very thing. James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary has a great story of himself as a kid in school, in elementary school. And he talks about this fact that one day, they had a problem with, with uh, somebody having firecrackers in school. And James Montgomery Boyce had never even thought about even using a firecracker. But then, as soon as the announcement was made in school that they were to make sure that they would never, ever bring those on school ground, he tells a story that within 45 minutes, him and his friends were in a closet at school with a firecracker lighting it off. And the principal comes in and he's just so irate. He just made this rule of having no firecrackers in the school and now they've let them off. And this is a perfect example of this reality. This is things that we do. If you have children, you know this is real. You know this is a part of their depravity. They will do things like this instantly. And this is exactly what Paul is describing. The law arouses this rebellion within us. We are born rebels. We're born with this natural antagonism to God. And when we become aware of this law in a specific way, it arouses this innate rebellion. It exposes what Paul says about us in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, where he will go on to say, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. And he goes on to say this, For it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's because we are hostile to God that we are hostile 
to God's law. See, here's what sin does. Sin cries. It yells from the housetop and proclaims our autonomy. It says, I bow before no one. I do what I want to do. And I see your law as a threat against my autonomy. I want to live life my way. I want to do what I want to do. And our culture testifies of this. Because our culture right now is acting in such a rebellious way. They are not only rebelling against God's revealed law, like Ten Commandments, laws revealed in Scripture, but now they're in a full front rebellion against God's natural law, against the created order. They look at themselves And in such rebellion, they cry out to the heavens, how dare you make me a woman? I want to be a man. Or they go on and say, how dare you make a creation that is binary? How dare you not give me a choice? I'm going to create other categories besides men and women. How dare you demonstrate that through your design that Sexual relations is supposed to be only between a man and a woman. I will have sex with whoever or whatever I want. How dare you give us a rainbow as a sign of your covenant of mercy. I will use it as a sign of rebellion against you. I will flaunt it before you, O God of heaven. I'm going to do whatever I want. You're not going to tell me to do anything. And it's the ultimate form of rebellion that they They've even passed his revealed law to his natural law. And here is how this works. This is how the law functions. This is what it does to to the sinful heart. Because in responding to the law of God in this way, it shows us just how wildly rebellious and sinful that we are. It brings out our sin as it bristles and objects at the sight and sound of his law. And guess what? Our sin would never be revealed or demonstrated in such a way without that law. That's how the law is used in this manner. Because it's provoking. It draws it out. It it sets sets it before us. We look around today and we see all this insanity that I just described. We see clown world in full effect. And we sit back and we wonder, well, why is this happening? We wonder, what is the cause of this? We'll wonder no longer. For we see unchecked, unharnessed rebellion against the law of God. See, you must understand and see sin for what it is. It is rebellion against the high king of heaven. Sin, by definition, is lawlessness. And sin is so powerful in us. That it uses the law of God, that which is good and righteous, and it exploits it for its own purposes of destruction and wickedness. And guess what it tells us? It succeeds in doing it. Remember last week when I told you that the law reveals the righteousness of Christ. And we know that, the, that Christ fulfills law, the law at every point. And during his earthly ministry, Christ was actively demonstrating the law of God through his life. And I ask you, what happened? What was the result of that? How did people respond to Christ? I mean, do we read in the Gospels that all this peace and tranquility settled into the land of Judea and Galilee during the time of Christ? No. We see nothing like that at all. What do we read? What does Jesus say happens when he shows up? Well, he tells us in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 34, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against his, her mother, And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. So what did Christ do when he came to the earth? What did his righteousness do? 
it provoked sin. He stirred it up. He pulled it out and he revealed it. He brought out this rebellion in his midst. He would bring to the surface man's true hatred for God. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Look there around verse 31. Here Jesus is in Capernaum. We're going to see here he describes this incident here where he is in the synagogue on the Sabbath and he is teaching the law of God. Verse 31, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching for his message was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. Now, I want you to notice something here. Something here that we need to pay close attention to. Do you think that anyone ever knew that that man in that synagogue that day had a demon? I don't think anybody did. He's probably going about his life. He probably, in his occupation, seemed like a fine Jewish upstanding man. There he is. He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath, doing what all good Jewish men do. He's there receiving the law. He's there. He, he's there to worship God. And so nobody even thinks for a minute or knows that he has a demon. The demon, we could say, lied dormant in this sense. Until when? Until he's confronted with Jesus' righteousness. And then what happens? He provokes the demon to speak. He provokes him from inside of him to reveal himself. Listen to me, the law has the same effect. It provokes the rebellion that is dormant inside of us as it arouses sin to activity. Now let me ask you this. Would Israel had ever have known The true hearts of the scribes and Pharisees, unless Jesus would have come and shown up? The answer is no. Their true nature was hidden. Everything was going along fine in Judaism until Jesus showed up. Everybody was all content. Everybody was all happy. Their little system was just going along just fine. Nobody was causing any problems. Everything just seemed all fine and dandy. Because their true nature was hidden. It was dormant. Their sin was dead, as Paul describes it here. Until they were confronted with true righteousness. The true fulfillment of the law. And then, and not until then, do you see their villainy. There you saw them hating true righteousness. Jesus, by his very nature, provoked sin. It made all of these people who were from the outside who appeared righteous to actually become his enemies. It demonstrated and revealed their true nature, their true hatred of God. He demonstrated what others couldn't see. Others saw whitewashed tombs. However, they didn't see dead men's bones inside. They were hidden until Jesus brought them out. Consider what Jesus says in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. He says on this matter, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. This is a remarkable statement by Jesus. If I wouldn't have shown up, they would have never have sinned. Now the question is, whose fault is that? 
what would happen today? Well, they probably, everybody blamed Jesus. Jesus is causing them to sin. It's Jesus' fault this is happening. What's Jesus say? But now they have no excuse for their sin. It's their sin. It's their fault. It's their problem. He just provoked it. He just brought it out. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. They sin because they hate God. And ultimately they hated his law. The law that they claim to delight in. Listen, this is the very reason and the very same concept that it set forth when Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. Why? Because anyone who demonstrates true righteousness that is consistent with the Lord Jesus Christ, which means their life is consistent with the law of God, they will be persecuted. Why is that? Because they will provoke the same rebellion to sin just like Christ does, just like the law does. If the world hates you, Jesus says what? It's because they hated me first. That's why. That's why they hate you. So, you tell me, hey, I don't have any enemies in this world. You tell me that you're this type of Christian who is able to get along with everyone and everybody and never has any trouble, never has any conflict. You tell me you're that kind of Christian. I'm going to ask you, what's wrong with you? Now, make sure I'm being careful here. I'm not talking about you going out making enemies because you're sinning against other people and you stay in unrepentant sin towards them. That's not what we're talking about. Peter deals with that kind of stuff in 1 Peter. Listen, if you're going to get persecuted, get persecuted for what? For righteousness sake. I'm also not just talking about provoking and antagonizing just to provoke and antagonize. I know some people like that too. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a life lived of righteousness. I'm talking about a world or a life that is consistent with everything that is, it is to be in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about you actually having true enemies for righteousness sake. And we learn from scripture that it should be commonplace for the believer to have struggles such as that. It's a whole reason for our theme of Bible school. Because the spiritual warfare just rages on. For when you live a righteous life, you will antagonize and you will provoke sin. And this is this common misconception among supposed Christians today. That is, if they live godly lives, they won't have conflict. They won't have enemies. They'll just kind of get along with everybody. They'll be in this symbiotic relationship with the world or something. And I say, if, if that's you, if that describes you, you're probably only a compromising Christian at best. For you're a far cry from looking like Christ or living like him. You're a long way off of demonstrating the righteousness in your life consistent with the law of God. This is why so many so-called Christians of this type are at awe when they read the Psalms and see how so many of the Psalms are to devoted to dealing with one's enemies. For it is commonplace. God has many enemies means what? We should have many enemies. John Murray says this, The more light from God's law that shines into our depraved hearts the more enmity of our minds is, is aroused to opposition, proving our mind is not subject to the law of God. See again, Paul here, what he's doing is he's vindicating the law of God. The law's good. The problem's not the law. The villain here is sin. 
Sin's the problem. And when the commandment comes in, sin seizes his opportunity to powerfully work in the life of a sinner. Paul is saying, the problem never was with the law. The problem has nothing to do for me with the Tenth Commandment. The problem was always my sin. And this is how the law of God convicts us of sin. By drawing out the sin that is dormant, and what it does is it exposes how awful and rebellious our hearts really are. It demonstrates how wildly rebellious we are before God. Now let's move into verse 9. I want to begin today, we're not going to get all the way through it, but I want to set the stage for it. The third way in which the law convicts us of sin, as it devastates the sinner. Look what he begins to say there in verse 9. He says, I was once alive apart from the law. Now what does Paul mean by this? Well, this is where Paul becomes a little harder to follow in his argument because we're going to see that he no longer uses language as consistent as he was using it before. He's going to start using terms a little differently here in context. The first one that we're faced with there is here in the beginning of verse 9 is this word he uses here, alive. He says, now he says apart from the law that he was alive. He did just tell us that apart from the law, sin was dead. I think actually what he's saying here is the same thing. He's just restating it here in a different way. Because a life here is not being used as he was using it earlier within his letter. Earlier in his letter, he's using life to talk about life eternal. Or a life unto God would be a way that he would use life. But now he's using this term, alive, in relative terms here. And the context now drives our understanding and interpretation of what he's saying here. Because we have to ask the question, what what does Paul mean when he says, I was once alive apart from the law? When we start going through this, we know what it can't mean. It can't mean that Paul ever lived a life without the knowledge of the law or the law itself. I mean, from a young age, Paul was trained in in the law. He was trained by Judaism's best and brightest, Gamaliel. Paul himself grew up to be one of Judaism's best and brightest. He was, as he confesses, as to the law, a Pharisee. I mean, he was an expert in the law. So there was never a moment in Paul's life that he didn't know the law of God, at least in this sense. So we know that he's not talking about a time that he wasn't we'll say, cognizant of the law of God. Much like the idea that he was always cognizant of the 10th commandment, you shall not covet, that we talked about last week. So obviously here, this can only be a reference to his time as a Pharisee, as an unbeliever, as someone in rebellion against Christ and his kingdom. He's talking about his life before he was ever convicted of any sin. Remember his testimony in Philippians 3? He thought that when it came to the righteousness, which is in the law, that he was what? Blameless. The law at that point was not convicting him of any sin. Oh, he knew about it. He had the law. He thought that he was fulfilling the law. So his experience was, and that's so important here as we start thinking about this now and how he's talking, because now he's not talking about, hey, this is really how things are or not. He's talking about his experience. His experience was in those days that he was alive. The law was not convicting him of sin. It was not affecting him as it should have. It was not doing its work in him. He was not conscious of the fact of how he was a sinner. So to him, everything was great. Everything was wonderful. Everything was going well. He's full of vigor, self-satisfied. He didn't have any internal resistance, no struggles. 
I mean, he'd go around congratulating himself on his self-righteousness and all of his glorious law-keeping. He's like, there was nobody like me, and I can keep the law. I'm, I'm zealous for my ancestral traditions. I mean, he thought he was really doing something. He was really accomplishing something. He was alive, and it, while he was alive, he was completely ignorant of this beast that was dormant inside of him. He had no idea of sin's tremendous power. Remember back in Luke chapter 11? There the Pharisees tried to accuse Jesus of casting out demons in the power of Beelzebul, which of course is the devil. And he goes to describe this strong man. The strong man is Satan, who's fully armed. He guards his own house. And what does he do when he guards his own house? His possessions are undisturbed. He's describing there that Satan actually can bring peace to people. He brings peace. They're undisturbed. They're not bothered. When do they become bothered? In that. Until the stronger one comes. This is an example of that. Paul felt alive even though he was spiritually dead. All was well. There was no problem at all until the commandment came. Meaning until he was convicted of that commandment they talked about in verse 7. The tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet. When that came, when that became real to him... When he saw that he was actually a transgressor of the law, things changed. But before then, he was alive. He was no different than the rich young ruler. Everything's fine. He thought he fulfilled the law at every point. Until Jesus revealed his idolatry. And then he went away what? Sad. Paul thought life was good. He had it licked. He was alive until the law convicted him of sin. And then what was the result after that? We read there, sin became alive and I died. Well, what does Paul mean when he said sin became alive? It means that he was at that point awakened to his true condition. Blameless, are you kidding me? Would be his response now. Now it's so wretched man that I am and ain't blameless anymore. He now saw the evilness of his own heart. It was at this point that Paul loathes his religious accolades. At this point, he realizes they were rubbish. They were, as he describes in Philippians 3, they were just a big pile of trash. He's like, what was I doing? What was I thinking? Sin is alive, and he, he knows now that he's the chief of sinners. He knows that he is actively violating the law of God, and he knows that he is condemned. He used to think horrible about those Gentiles, thinking about how they were going to spend forever in Hades, and then he realized, oh man, that's me. I've got the same destiny. He says that when this happened, he says, I died. Well, how do we understand what he means by this? Well, we can only understand what he means by I died in relationship to what he meant when he said he was alive. He no longer possessed this self-worth. He no longer was pleased with himself and his accolades. He no longer saw power in and of himself he realizes the term self-righteousness was in itself a contradictory statement. He had no righteousness of himself that was worth anything before a holy God, and thus he died. He realized his weakness. He realized that he was hopeless, and not just hopeless, but helpless. He realized that he was wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, his self-confidence was smashed into pieces. His self-reliance in those days vanished. What he is describing here is what Jesus describes on the Sermon on the Mount when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
And the man who is poor in spirit is contrite. He knows that he's a great sinner. He is the humble man. He knows that he is guilty of treason against heaven. And he mourns his own sinful condition. He's troubled and unhappy in his lawlessness. The rebellion of his heart is overwhelming and he despises it. This is a contrite and humble man. This is what Paul is describing here. This is probably how he felt as he lied prostrate before Christ on the road to Damascus. I promise you at that moment, Paul wasn't feeling alive when Jesus showed himself. I can kind of just picture like all vitality and life in him almost being sucked out of him before Christ. Feeling the full weight of his, the pollution, his sin. Feeling how unrighteous that he is. Really understanding that all of his righteousness was just a bunch of filthy rags. Oh, he was overtly aware of his own wretched condition in those days. And this is what Paul means when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, that the letter kills. This is exactly what he's getting at. See, this is the purpose and the function of the law. It's not to justify us. Paul tells us here it's not even to sanctify us. It's to reveal sin to us. It's to show us the true nature of sin by provoking it. And then what it does is it devastates the sinner. And if these things don't happen, no one's going to turn to Christ. No one's going to flee the wrath to come. No one's going to desire Christ's righteousness when they're smug and content with their own righteousness. When they're alive. When they feel that they don't need anything. When they're the self-made man. They don't seek Christ. Listen, I want you to confront yourself with a, and ask yourself a hard question this morning. Is what Paul described in his experience and interaction with the law, has that happened to you? Do you have a similar experience as Paul did? Has the commandment came to you and caused you to proclaim with him, I died. Have you cried out to God and proclaimed your unworthiness to Him? Have you groaned and loathed your own miserable condition? Has the law of God brought you low? If not, I, I wouldn't put much confidence in yourself of being a true believer. For until you see your ruin, you don't seek the remedy. Until you see your wounds, you don't chase after the cure. And until you see your righteousness as holy and adequate and defiled, you will not desire and seek the righteousness of Christ. What do we do with a proud sinner? What do we do when we come across people who are alive in this sense as Paul described himself before. What do they need from us? What's it communicating that we should do? We preach law. We need to produce the same effect in their life. They need to come to an end of themselves. They need to see their wickedness. They need to see that they do not measure up. And they need to, to see that indeed their righteousness amounts to filthy rags. Now, is that the way that we handle when we come across somebody who already has a contrite and humble heart and is broken over their sin? No. That's not the law's function. The law has no place there. The law is to cause that. What do we give them then when they're broken and they're contrite? We give them the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus. That's what we give them. We tell them of this hope that's out there. 
We give them the remedy for their brokenness. We tell them that Christ has died. He's paid the penalty of sinners on that cross. We tell them that while He was alive, He fulfilled the law in every way and that He procured in Himself a righteousness that we need. And that He gives that righteousness to us. A righteousness that has met all of the law's demands. A reliable righteousness that will be effective for all eternity and is the standard of heaven. And we tell them that that forgiveness, that righteousness can be theirs by faith alone. We give them the gospel. This is the proper function of law and gospel. It's law to the proud and it's grace to the humble. The law brings the sinner low. The gospel brings them to the highest heights. The law devastates and ruins the sinner. The gospel heals and remedies all that ails. The law provokes rebellion in the sinner. The gospel leads to delighting in the law of God. Let us be people who do not seek life through the law of God. For that is not its purpose. It's not its design. It's not its lawful use. For as Paul tells us, the law is a ministry of death. But let us seek life in the one whose life itself, in Christ Jesus, who gives us his spirit. Let's pray. Father, We thank you for what you reveal to us in your word. Certainly, there is a lot for us to discern when interacting with those around us, even interacting with our own hearts. And Father, I pray that you could give us the wisdom to understand how to use the law lawfully. That we might use it in its good function. That we might use it to to provoke sin and to, and to also at the same time to, to devastate and to ruin the sinner. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that both the law and the gospel have its perfect work in the life of those who are here. That it's already had its perfect work and that we are not in rebellion against God's law, but that we delight in it, that we love it that we seek it and desire it. And Father, I pray now that you would just be good to us as we reflect upon all the great mercies that we have through your Son, Jesus. That that gracious gift that you've given to us so that we might be redeemed from all of our sins, that we might have life everlasting, that we may be forever with Christ and brought into union with Him that will never expire. Father, I pray that we might have great hope in that today, that it might stir joy in our heart to realize what we have as ruined sinners. Father, be gracious to us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.